said that the correct couch, Good. she'd rather sit on You're the like, I don't want you any closer to me, Tom Kenny. Okay. No, I, I mean, I can, I can come sit next to you, but I kind of like this, you know, living room vibe. I yeah. like it. I like it. I like yeah. it, too. So, I mean, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Almost 20 years, SpongeBob. Jeez, I feel old. Did you ever imagine, <laughs> when you first signed on to play the role, that you would be sitting here with such a passionate and, and dedicated fan base? No, and thank you guys. Thanks so much. Woo! <laughs> No, I mean, next year it'll be 20 years of Spongebob because it, it uh, debuted in 99. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's just, uh, you know, you're just trying to get a gig when you're an actor. And then, <laughs> and, and then uh, you know, you make a pilot, then you hope the pilot gets mm -hmm. picked up, and then you hope that the, you know, the series gets picked up for another season, and next thing you know, it's two decades later. Well, and when you're, when you're pitched the show, you know, yeah, he's, he's a sponge, he lives in a pineapple, and he's, the, what, what, what were your initial thoughts? Well, Steve Hillenburg pitched me the show because uh -huh. he, uh, you know, he had worked on Rocco's Modern Life. You know, it's his first day. <laughs> Steve Hillenburg's a beautiful person, you know, and, and uh, so he kind of had this idea percolating in his brain uh, after Rocco came to its end after after the three seasons or whatever. Uh, Steve uh, got a chance to pitch his own show, and he had he he was really into ocean science, and so he had. He had done a little comic book called The Intertidal Zone, where to give to the kids, he worked at a summer camp where uh -huh. they were learning about oceanography and ocean sciences. So he made a little comic book called The Intertidal Zone that uh, would introduce kids to the animals that live in the tide pool, uh, you know? So, so, you know, crabs and starfish and, uh, you know, sponges and stuff like that. So when he got a chance to pitch his own thing to, to Nickelodeon, he went back to that old comic book that he had made for kids when he, when he was a camp counselor and said, maybe there's something there. So after Rocco, he had me come to his house and he showed me, he said, this is what I'm thinking of pitching, you know, and he, he just had everything laid out so beautifully together. And Nickelodeon had not seen it yet. Nobody had seen anything SpongeBob yet, except for a couple of his friends. He's a very shy guy. And, and so he had, you know, drawings of SpongeBob, who was called SpongeBoy at that time. And, uh, and, you know, Mr. Krabs and Squidward, and he had like little uh, watercolor paintings of SpongeBob's mm. pineapple house and Squidward's tiki head house and the lobster trap Krusty uh, uh, Krab uh, restaurant. And he just had it all so well thought out, and it was so magical and beautiful. And he was kind of shy about showing it to me, like, I don't know, it's just like just stupid, you know? And I was like, I, I just fell in love with it instantly. And, he said, I want you to be the voice of Spongebob. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I'm going to try to have Nickelodeon not audition any other actors. You're the guy, you know, I, wow. I think you have some Spongebob personality. You know, he's got some of your DNA. You have, you have some of his DNA. And so it's, it's, uh, I was telling somebody a little earlier today, it's the only gig on my resume, on my IMDb that I did not have to audition for. Wow. Was Spongebob. Because usually as an actor, your whole life is auditioning. You go out and you, you know, you just hope that you're the person they pick, you know? And they're, oh, it's down to you and four other guys. Oh, it's down to you and three other guys. It's down to you and one other guy. And then, you know, this kind of grueling process and then they go, oh, they went with the other guy or, or hey, you got it, or they went with a celebrity or whatever. You know, there's vari variations of the, of the way it can take, but you just hope that, you're, that, that your audition is the one that pops a little bit more. So they go, God, I kind of like what that guy's did with, with his audition. But SpongeBob, I didn't have to worry about any of that. Everybody else auditioned. You know, Bill Faker, Bucky Patrick, and, and Squidward, you know, Roger Bumpus, everybody uh, had to uh, audition. And then, you know, Steve really had a clear idea, just the same way he did visually. He had a really clear idea of orally what he wanted for every character to sound like. And I'm still amazed, 20 years later, I'm just amazed that he kind of had this x-ray vision where all the actors on the show are kind of like their characters in real life, you know? And Steve knew me, but he didn't know the other people. And, you know, Bill does have some Patrick in him, and uh, Roger does right. have some, some, some uh, Squidward in him, and, and mm -hmm. Mr. Lawrence does have some Plankton in him. And uh, it's, it's, it's funny that he was just able to, just to be that intuitive, I'm, I'm just like, what's, what's that like? Well, and to have such a, the universe all planned out, and then to see it executed, that's pretty rare. Yeah, uh, yeah. As and, well. Yeah, and he fought for his creation, like stuff that, 
that maybe the network wanted to change or that, you know, he, he dug in on it and, and fought for his vision in a way that's, um, you know, pretty inspirational uh, to me 20 years down the road. I'm like, yeah, you, you have to do that if you want your vision to reach. It, it's a very delicate dance, you know, because you, you have to play well with others. It's, it's their, you know, your show's on a network and they hold all the cards and want them to pick up your show. But they also have a lot of ideas that might not fit your conception and they'll try to voice those upon you, you know? And Steve was always very good at dancing the dance, you know, of, of, of a little, little, you got to, but basically it's choose your battles, pick your battles, right? That, that's kind of what the whole business that's, that's is about. A metaphor for life. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> choose your battles. So the voice actually of SpongeBob is kind of a hybrid of a couple different, you know, yes. components. And so I'm wondering if you can talk us through the process of creating that voice and, and the character. Yeah, well, really it came again from Steve knowing what he wanted. And, and Steve's not a voice guy, you know, not an actor, and doesn't want to be. And he, he, so he just described SpongeBob's psyche in such good, awesome detail to me and had, you know, all these visual aids and pictures. And, you know, I, I, God, I, I remember him saying, you know, he's half a boy and half a man. He's kind of like a grown up, but he's a kid too. He lives by himself in a house. But he's also like a little kid, you know, he's got a job, but he's also very childish. And him and Patrick are like four-year-olds, you know, that, that that still hold hands and skip around together. And, you know, kind of like Pee Wee Herman meets a munchkin meets, you know, he had, he had like all these things. And, and, and I knew exactly where he needed me to go. Yeah. And, and he was, uh, yeah, it was perfect. So, so when SpongeBob came oh out, you know, once the, you know, the, ah, the laugh light came out of nowhere, Steve was like, wow, that's great. Don't change it. Don't change it. That's cool. It's like a dolphin. It's like it's like a dolphin poking its head out of the water, doing that. In in the beginning, did you know you were going to voice other characters as well on the on show? SpongeBob? Yeah. You know, as so often happens, you know. Or did that just evolve naturally? Well, well, this is kind of you know inside baseball stuff, but but when you when you're um, when you're doing like a SAG after a you know union scale voiceover gig, they get three voices out of you. Right, and then with your fourth voice, uh, when you go up to four voices, you get like a little bump, like 10% bump or whatever. And so, uh, you know, that scale payment generally is for one to three voices. So it behooves them cost-wise to just hire people that can do a few different voices. So, so yeah, I was always Gary from the beginning. And then, uh, you know, two hours later, the French narrator that was based on uh, uh, Jacques Cousteau, Cousteau. Right, right, right. so I just started doing him uh, pretty early on. <laughs> but again, like when you start doing this stuff, nobody thinks that you're still going to be doing it 20 years later. And the same thing with the Apache the Pirate on camera segments, they were just like, you know, Steve was like, we want to do some framing devices that are just like the ultimate crappy, low budget <laughs> kids show, you know, on your local station. And, 1966, you know, and um, and so yeah, so I was just there, yeah, you know, I was just there. They're like, okay, you know, so you know, they slap a patch on you and, and, and then black out your tooth and you're patchy the pirate, and you know, that, it's it's uh, yeah, it's a blast. It's still it's still fun to do. We still do it every Wednesday, and I, I you know, we all still really look forward to to doing it. Well, I mean, I don't know if this is necessarily truth, but I did read that you guys record as a group and not a oh, yeah. which is Absolutely. really unusual, I think. Yeah, a lot of yeah. animation. We all record together, and I'm the voice director, too, uh, for the last few seasons. So, so uh, yeah, I think it really gained something. It might not immediately be perceptible to your conscious ear, but I think there's something about getting these people that know their characters really well all in a room at the same time and just performing it like it's a radio play, like it's a radio show. And it's not like, oh, show up and do your lines and you'll be in and out in an hour and then we'll have Squidward come in for an hour and we'll cut, we'll cut everybody together. Uh, you know, a lot of shows do do it that way and most uh, feature films do do it that way. But I don't know, I love all the stuff that I love, like Bullwinkle and Rocky and Looney Tunes and all that. Like, like people were in the room at the same time, you know, any of the Hanna-Barbera stuff, Flintstones, Jetsons, all that. You know, most people were, you know, people were there at the same time. And so, um, uh, luckily, the, I would say the majority of shows that I'm on do ensemble recording, even though I think that's getting increasingly rare, but for some reason, I tend to get on shows where they do it that way. 
that's you know? yeah. I mean, I yeah. think it would make a big difference, and I think it's so much more fun. We're cracking each other up, yeah. you know, and uh, you know, there's, there's some off-color ad libs uh, flying around, you know, and uh, it's, no. uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there's some there's some tapes out there. So let's <laughs> let's go back to the beginning of your career. You've been a part of so many great projects, as you just mentioned, a few, and you know, Adventure Time, and uh, so many other things. But I want to know at the beginning, how did you sort of break into the voiceover business? It's it's kind of an exclusive little group. It is. It, I, I wanted to be a voiceover guy way before I was able to get my nose under the tent. It was really hard uh, to get my nose. It was such a, uh, a tough nut to crack, you know? And uh, so I started out as a stand-up, like, pretty young. Like, like by, by my early 20s, I was already making a living as a stand-up comedian, you know, where I, I didn't have to have a regular job and stuff. I was like, okay, I guess I guess I figured this out okay. So, uh, so, and then, and then I wrote on shows, you know, and stuff like that. And but voiceover was always the thing that I wanted to be doing. But I couldn't, I just couldn't break that freaking glass ceiling. It was driving me crazy. And then uh, uh, Rocco was my first. Uh, uh, Rocco's Modern Life was my first animated series. And Carlos Ellis Rocky, who did the voice of Rocco, had been a stand-up in Northern California and San Francisco as well. And Joe Murray, the creator of Rocco, said, hey, are there any other, are there any voiceover people, you know, any guys that I should know about that I'm not hearing? And Carlos said, this guy Tom Kenny, he's funny, and he does, does different voices. So Carlos, I, I pretty much owe Carlos, you know, for everything. You know, Car Carlos got me in on Rocco, and that's where I met Steve Hillenberg, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, everything. It, you realize, I mean, whatever career you're in, it's really about the people you meet along the way that has much more to do with with the big picture than whatever, where you went to school or where you studied or, or, or it's, it's really just the people you meet in your salad days are the, are the people that you wind up kind of running into for the next 40 years of your career. And I still work with Carlos. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's really true. It's I always say, you know, the business is kind of like one big high school. You know, it is. It is. Yeah, and it's nice. And I, I, I'm actually that rare person that actually liked high school. You know, I, I had a good. People like, oh, I would never go back to high school. I'm like, I had a pretty freaking good time in high school. You know, but uh, you're right. It is. It is. Yeah. It is like high school, but it maybe even a little better because you kind of know who you are already. Yeah, I think you're you know? right. Yeah, you're, as, you're kind as of not a. Pod, you're, you're not a. Invasion of the Body Snatchers pod person, kind of half formed. Um, that's your description of a teenager, right? Yeah, that's what a teenager is. Yeah, you're like a pod person. A pod person. Yeah. Um, I can't think of a job that would be more difficult than stand up. So tell us a little bit about your time on the circuit and oh, gosh. how you should develop your routines. You know, I, I had a good time doing stand up. I, I just uh, I started doing it, in fact, uh, like, you know, uh, to go way back. I, the, the first time I did stand-up, I answered an ad in my local alternative uh, newspaper in Syracuse, New York, the Syracuse New Times, which is like the Chicago Reader or whatever. And in 1978, um, I answered an ad. There was, there was a little classified ad saying, you know, I'm starting a stand-up comedy open mic here in town. Anybody interested, please call this number, blah, blah, blah. And it was this guy named Barry Crimmins. And um, my high school friend, Bobcat Goldthwaite, and I, uh, yeah. Bobcat and I met in first grade. We met when we were six years old. We've known each other since we were six. We're even and I still hang out with him like once a week, you know, like 50 years later, you know, literally 50 years later, half a century later, him and I are still kicking around going, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, we still sort of don't know what we're doing, but I guess we're doing okay. And he, uh, 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 we answered this ad in the newspaper and we showed up and this guy, Barry Crimmins, who was kind of this crusty, guy with a cigarette and a big mustache, you know, we showed up, we said, okay, we're here for the open mic. He said, your children. <laughs> you didn't tell me when you called that you were children. <laughs> we said, well, you didn't ask about what we were, you know, and then he said, well, I can't put you on. You're not even supposed to be, you're not even supposed to be in this place. It's a bar, you know, you're not even supposed to be in here. You know, I can't put you up. And we said, come on, put us up. We drove here in a blizzard. We drove 45 minutes in a, in a snowy blizzard, you know, put us up. And he put us up. And, and he was, uh, Barry Crimmins was kind of the first guy, the first adult in my life that was really, that, 
was kind of associated with show business, kind of, that, that was uh, encouraging. And he said, wow, you, you know, you're good. You, you can do this. You can, you can do this. You know, this is in Syracuse, you know. Every, every other adult in my life was trying to get me to learn how to cut meat or work on an auto assembly line or something like that. Like, that's what all my, you know, that's what people did in Syracuse, you know. And they didn't really understand the aspiration of somebody who wants to be be Mel Blanc, you know, they're, they're like, oh, I want to be a cartoon voice guy, you're like, yeah, that's nice, have fun with that, you know, meanwhile, learn how to cut meat, uh, you know, you'll always have a job, Tommy, people will always need, people will always need a butcher, so, it is you know, true, it's true, so, uh, so Barry Crimmins, uh, uh, was the, this guy that was instrumental to Bobcat and I starting out, and then Barry Crimmins moved from Syracuse to Boston, Massachusetts became kind of like a big wig on the Boston comedy scene, booking shows and that. And Bobcat and I moved to Boston when we were, you know, 20, you know, 19, 20 years old. And uh, and so he was, you know, Barry took care of us there and, and made sure that we got on it places. And interesting, I don't, I don't know if you guys, uh, this Barry Crimmins guy, if you Google him, it'll blow your mind. He just passed away. And uh, he, he passed away in, in March. And um, Barry, was one of the early people, like when computers were just starting out, like like Barry, oh, like was an early adapter to computers and became a warrior for uh, victims, for young victims of sexual abuse. Because Barry had been uh, abused as a kid by a family friend. So in addition to being a comedian, he was very early on, like in the days of dial-up modems, became maybe, the first, one of the first, if not the first, people to, to uh, uh, trap uh, predators online, like pose oh, as, wow. as a 12 year old or whatever, and like get these guys. So he went up and uh, uh, testified in front of Congress, like in the early days of computers saying, you know, this is, there's stuff going on, there's people trading files and stuff, and the companies don't care because they get paid by the minute or the hour for the modem, they're not vetting what's, they're not vetting what's, what people are trading, and it is a, it is a superstore for, for this, this awful, this sick stuff that victimizes kids. So, so Barry, you know, Barry's kind of like, he's, he's kind of like this Avenger, you know, he's got, he, so it's kind of a crazy, a, a, a cool guy to meet when you're 16 years old, and, and he impacted my whole life, his politics, he was the first radical, he was the first political radical that I had ever met. You know, like left of left of left, and that that obviously imprinted really uh, uh, deeply on me too. So, so uh, Bobcat made a documentary about Barry called "Call Me Lucky" that you can watch for free on uh, Vimeo and places like that. If you guys uh, get a chance to see it, it's it's quite amazing. And Barry went on to have this you know big uh, influence on you know whatever everybody from Margaret Cho to Pat Oswalt to to people like that. Wow, that that is that is such barbarian. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. We're gonna take audience questions if you guys wanna line up at the mics. There's gonna be some mics in the aisle. And while people are getting themselves organized, I think there's been, what, 229 episodes of SpongeBob or something like that? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, something around 228 and a half. Eight and a half, yeah. yeah. Is there a standout episode, and if so, for what reason? Oh man, those first couple of seasons are always like the best, you know. <laughs> uh, any, any, anytime a show is like forming and it's in its infancy and, and stuff is just, you know, you're, you're, con you're starting to conquer the world. That's a great time, you know? And, and I've been on a lot of shows and, and I, I love that period where it's just starting to catch on, where you see, wow, Powerpuff, Powerpuff Girls is starting to oh, catch like on, it. you know, yeah. back then, or yeah, they like it, you know, or or, uh, or Adventure Time, anything like that, Rick and Morty. Um, those are all shows where like, you go, wow, this means a little bit more to people than, oh, than the regular Morty show. Like yeah. Yeah. That's and a lot of kids that grew up on Spongebob, so like, I, I didn't realize that, like, Spongebob was, like, the Rick and Morty starter kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like all these, all these kids that were 10 years old, uh, like, when Spongebob started out, or 8 years old, and now it's 20 years later, and they're going, dude, I really love Rick and Morty, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, squatchy, dude, bro. <laughs> It definitely wasn't. The, the Could you do me a favor and not do Mr. Jellybean, King Jellybean, please? Could you not do that? That creeps me out. It's like, okay. Hi, we'll start over here. Oh, there we are. Hi, I'm Jimmy. I'm from Lansing, Michigan. Hi, Jimmy. Uh, is there, you talked about going on a lot of, lot of auditions. Is there any audition that you didn't get that you really wish you did? Oh, or every day. That you did get, or, yeah. Oh, audition? so, so one that I didn't get that I wish I got? And, and also one that you didn't get that you're glad you didn't get. Oh, you know. 
I wouldn't say like as a, as a journeyman after that you're happy every time you close the deal and you go, hey, great, I got to, you know, you never stop being that kind of hungry guy that's in there pitching, you know, ham and eggs, uh, a, a brawler, you know what I mean? Like the bottom of the fight card, you know? But uh, uh, I would say there, there have been auditions that I've done where you just go almost to a wall and like really like bring it in the audition and then you get the gig and then you have to do that for four years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like Eduardo on uh, Foster's. You know, I'm uh, like doing this for like years. I am not of my life. Potatoes, potatoes, I like potatoes. Like, like you're like, wow, that's really hard to do for four hours. I'm a, uh, I wish I'd done a slightly different voice in the audition, but now I'm trapped, you know? But but, but I do audition all the time, and, and there's a... Yeah, I would say, what what skill that you learn to have, and, and, and I, I had I, I was lucky enough that as a stand-up comedian, I developed it early, you know, before I was even doing voiceover, is just letting stuff go. You know what I mean? You, you get you, you rhino skin. You get what we call it rhino skin. You, you just get really thick rhino skin. So you you just like all right, now t tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow's another audition. But uh, yeah, there's some stuff that I've gotten really close on, like Fry on the uh, on Futurama. Uh, yeah. Like I went down to the wire on Fry, and I, uh, you know, but now, I, now, you know, Billy West. There, Other things. Billy West there. is Fry. You know what I mean? Like, there's no. I wouldn't have been as good as as, 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 as Billy. So, so, but you know, there's always stuff where you go, ah, I missed it by that much, but you know, it all works out. Thank you. Great question. It, thanks. Yeah, good question. You have to have. Yeah, a, the, the universe goes back in a balance, you know. You have to have a certain ability as an artist to be okay with not knowing what's happening next. Yeah, you have no control over your yeah. destiny. Well, what you have control over is your audition. Your performance. So, so all you can do is go, I'm just going to try to read these tea leaves and look at this drawing and, and that little personality profile they gave me. And I'm going to try to make, really it's about, auditions, right, are about making your best guess. So you're like, all I can do is make my best guess. And then once I put that out into the universe, my relationship with it's kind of over. You know, uh, it's, I have to move on, and then if it's a you know if it's a booty call that I can revisit later, then, uh, <laughs> then okay, maybe I'm back. You know, but it's like uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a weird, yeah. it's a weird way to live. Civilians, uh, civilians, kind of, um, it's hard for them to yeah. figure to, to picture it. You know? We're gonna go over here. Hi. Hi, my name is Monica. I'm Hi, Monica. Southside Chicago. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> We're Southside. So, um, my question is, is that you done so many characters over a number of years, and especially with you doing Spongebob for so many years and seasons, how do you keep it fresh as a voice actor, all the different characters over time? You know, that's a great question. And, you know, I feel like we don't have to keep it fresh because the writing keeps it fresh. And also, what always stays fresh is just that you're glad you got a job. Right. You know, you know it's never like, oh, I gotta go and do Spongebob, or I gotta do the ice cream for four hours, time to make the donuts, you know? It, it's never like that. It's always like, yeah, you know what I mean? It's like, wow, you know, because I've never had a plan B. So th this is it, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm, I'm unloading trucks, or, you know, or, or doing some, I, I, I never had any other skills except what I do, so, uh, which in a way was good because it just makes you just pursue the crap out of that because you, because you, you there's no other choice. No alternative. Yeah, you know, I have no alternative. I gotta like really kill it at this, you know, or, or else, because uh, I, you know. Yeah. Uh, my wife is from the Southwest side, like Midway Airport was her backyard. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, there was like the runway of Midway Airport and then my wife's house, you know, <laughs> really. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, we're, it, like she and I have zero days of college uh, experience between us. So, uh, yeah, so she, she joined Second City right out of, High school here in Chicago, and I and I started doing stand up kind of right right in high school. So so uh, yeah, we neither of us ever had a plan B. So it's it's amazing that we managed to like uh, you know raise two kids and not be living in a car cardboard box under a bridge. Well, congratulations. Thanks. Thank 